someone said, but it, it didn't used to be a kitchen table issue, but then when the kitchen table started washing down the street, it became one. Um, so there's that. And then prior to that, as you would know, there's been decades of failed action or inadequate action or action and then dismantled action. Um, and then every time an election came around, the major parties would get the issue of climate change and bash each other over the head with it. So it became a poison chalice and it's just been so extraordinarily weaponized and politicized. So it's a multi-generational issue. People my age have been worried for decades. Um, other people have become worried more since 2007. Then people have been worried that the major parties just seem to be use, using it as a political plaything. And then wham, bam, everyone's just getting hit with the impact in recent years. So you add all of that up. It all just made for the perfect storm. Maybe to start, I'd love to get a bit of background about your story, um, what you're doing at the moment and what led you to the current place that you are. Yeah. Well, I'm an associate professor at the University of Tasmania and my areas of expertise are, are besides climate policy and climate change politics, is um, environmental policy, green politics, and just general public policy. I've done a couple of books that are general on public policy and they're mainly motivated from this idea of problem solving and lesson learning and um, not taking enduring problems with us into the future, but solving them. And I guess I came to that because of my interest in climate change and environmental policy and those issues just getting pushed on and pushed on from generation to generation without being resolved. But I came into all this because I was a cross country ski instructor and um, athlete. I've represented Australia four times. And um, when I thought I needed to settle down, I thought oh, I don't really want a real job, so I'll study. And um, what do I know? And I thought, well, I, I know about recreation planning and the environment. So I studied in that area and fell in love with policy as a way to solve problems in that area and didn't come into it through politics. Um, and then did a PhD. And of course, in looking at problem solving, then you inevitably encounter politics, which I actually hate really, but I understand is an unlocking key um, for public policy. So a bit of a varied background. I'm still uh, writing a book at the moment on um, a notion I have of, of um, exploring how climate leadership could be examined in the region of East Asia Pacific, not so much from China and the US, which get all the attention, but from the intermediate countries in that region mm. because they're so varied between developed and developing. If we don't get climate action in that region, um, well, let's just put it more positively. We need to get climate action in that region. Um, and for those countries, there's a lot of economic opportunities from embracing a low carbon mm -hmm. future. So that's sort of my background. I've actually just taken early retirement so that I can get back into my exercise and writing. And, um, and, and ever since, that's about February, I've just done non-stop media and, and writing. Um, it's just been manic. So I don't know how, how I had time <laughs> to work. <laughs> well, no, it sounds very interesting. And uh, I love how you came from that unique background of being involved in cross country. Uh, and I suppose a, a, a theme that we talk about a lot is this theme of cognitive diversity and using your eclectic experience uh, in life and sort of using that and uh, in conjunction with uh, areas that have may have already been targeted. So using your experience in cross country and then combining that with an academic background and environmental policy, which is very, very fascinating. Yeah. And maybe we can get more into your research about the book maybe later on. And, yeah. and, and if not, I'm happy to discuss uh, after we, after we read the book, I'd be great to purchase that, but maybe to start with, um, just to give you a bit of background, we spoke with a finance expert, uh, Tim Buckley, uh, before the election. Yeah. And we basically were speaking about climate change in the context of the finance industry and how there's been a huge shift in the financial sector uh, in terms of investment towards renewables yeah. uh, and, and the like. But that was pre-election. And yeah. our hope was that the, the then government, which had shown you know, a lot of inaction over the past 10 years, would be voted out. And uh, happy to report that that has been the case. Yes. Um, 
but I think it'd be good for our listeners and also uh, for everyone that may not be across it uh, to sort of talk about why was that particular election in Australia so important, um, not only in, a, I guess, a domestic context, but like a global context as well. Yes. Um, it's interesting you should ask that because I did a panel show for Al Jazeera on exactly asking exactly that um, question. Uh, there were three of us, a couple of young people and an older person myself about why was it such an important election for climate change? I, I think, as you would appreciate, the answer is multi-layered. But if I just go into the immediate past, in the immediate past, let's say in the term of this government, there was, there was I want to say unprecedented, but they probably weren't. But there was bushfires, droughts, rain, rain, bushfires, floods, floods, floods was flooding when they were voting in Queensland. And the way that I think of it, we were flooded here in um, a couple of years ago. Uh, and I live in Hobart next to a rivulet, which you would never, like, it just wouldn't happen. But, yeah. Um, and a childcare centre along the rivulet here flooded just before the election, which has never happened. So I'm thinking that um, of all the concern with climate change we've had over the last 30 years, this recent period of time has actually brought it into people's homes as something to be quite frightened of and worried about for their personal safety. Um, and some of that has been in conservative electorates. And I remember thinking, I know Queensland won it for the conservative government in 2019, but Queensland's where there's been the floods, incredibly terrible floods uh, in conservative electorates. And because there was a non-response from the federal government on, on uh, climate change, but also extraordinarily, there was a non-response on assisting with flooding. I just thought this is all really immediate. So um, it's gonna be a climate change election from that point of view alone. Uh, someone said, but it, it didn't used to be a kitchen table issue, but then when the kitchen table started washing down the street, it became one. Um, so there's that. And then prior to that, as you would know, there's been decades of failed action or inadequate action or action and then dismantled action. Um, and then every time an election came around, the major parties would get the issue of climate change and bash each other over the head with it. So it became a poison chalice and it's just been so extraordinarily weaponized and politicized. So, um, that just has also come to a head, I think, for people and um, especially young people with the um, climate strikes and school kids with the school strikes, which I go to down here, find them very inspiring. So it's a multi-generational issue. People my age have been worried for decades. Um, other people have become worried more since 2007. Then people have been worried that the major parties just seem to be use, using it as a political plaything. And then wham, bam, everyone's just getting hit with the impact in recent years. So you add all of that up. The other thing that I like to add in, which isn't often, but you've mentioned it, is that we're holding back economic opportunity and industrial innovation and a powerhouse new industry that could develop in Australia around low carbon products and energy. Um, so there's also the economics. So this election, we actually had the business community wanting strong action on climate change. And for those who actually have yet got money in superannuation, the superannuation industries have been disinvesting, um, not rapidly, but they have a trend of disinvesting from fossil fuel investments because they don't want people's super to be tanking in their company because then they'll leave that company and go somewhere else. So it's become a financial thing. It all just made for the perfect storm. And honestly, I hope that's behind us and we can just act on climate change now. But we do have to unravel the, um, the coal and gas fired recovery that our previous government put in place. Absolutely. And maybe just to summarise uh, summarize that, because there was a lot of pearls of uh, pearls within that uh, within that uh, elaboration. So I guess the main takeaway is that the issue of climate change is something that historically has been uh, has there's been a lot of inaction. But as a result of climate action being on the front doors of everyone of everyone's houses in Australia, 
Uh, and like you said, there was, you know, people's houses were flooded, especially in key electorates, such as those conservative electorates where in the previous election, the conservatives, essentially, that's where they got their, they got their win. Those electorates have swung. And uh, now essentially the wider community is recognized it's here. And yes. it's very hard to deny that or to cast a doubt, which has historically been the case with climate science, yes. especially when you're having floods, which have never, ever occurred before. Yes. And not only that, but reoccurring and yes. reoccurring fires and worse fires. And so I suppose with that in mind, I think it'd be interesting to dive into the specifics of the election in terms of what played out uh, in terms of what governments were elected, uh, maybe what was different this time. And I think it would be really interesting to note because you've written about this, about uh, not only Labor having a, a slightly better policy than the Liberals, but also um, the Greens, which are the f f farther left party, which have a much stronger and science-based climate policy, as well as the independents. Could you tell us a bit about the, the current political makeup of the parliament yes, and uh... what that means? Okay, so um, if you were to uh, put a ruler in the trend line of support for major parties, and there's essentially two, one is a coalition of conservative parties on the right, and then you've got Labor on the left. And if you looked at the um, public support for those major parties from 1950 to, to today and put a ruler through it, it may go up and down a little bit, but essentially it's been going down, the support for those two major parties. And minor parties and independents have been breaking in. So the difference with this election is they broke in big time on this issue of climate change. And so the parliament now, even though the Labor, uh, Labor Party managed to get a majority of seats across the country, managed to turn enough electorates in its favour, in terms of the percentage of the vote, it's probably, I think, almost its lowest ever percentage support. So it's only got about 31% of the Australian public having voted for it. Otherwise, the reason that was able to form majority government is because preferences flowed to the Labor Party rather than flowing to the coalition. Um, so that means that in we have a crossbench that is not uh, a major, uh, comprised of major party politicians or members of parliament, a crossbench of independents. Some of those come from the country uh, and a whole bunch of new teal independents. And we call, they call themselves teal. And the reason why I, I describe it as they're a conservative blue tinged with um, climate aware green. And so that becomes a teal sort of color. And there's six of those elected, and then uh, there's there's a few previous independents that have been re-elected who now align with the Teals. And just um, for the audience, a very brief overview about Teals is concern for climate, uh, desire for an anti-corruption commission nationally to be established, and action on women um, women's issues. So those three things, which were ignored by the previous government. Um, and then we have the Greens, and we had one MP, Green MP, in our lower house where a government is formed, the House of Representatives. But we, that one has been joined by three Greens now, so there's four total Greens. And those three Greens, they turned both Conservative and Labor seats in um, the northern state of Queensland, which is, as we were saying, was hard hit by floods more, more than once. And during the election campaign and on voting day. So the Greens were very active in the community in supporting the community through the flooding crisis when the federal government didn't come to the fore. So the parliament now is comprised of a very diminished right, which is um, the Liberal Party and the National Party. Nationals coming from the country, Liberals more representing business interests in the city. So. That's the right the coalition. They're quite diminished. Labor with a majority of 77, maybe 78 seats, and then a bunch of cross benches. So it's really split, almost third, third, third. And um, and the the incoming manager of government business is today meeting um, up in the House of Representatives with the parliamentary clerks, looking at standing orders which govern the operations of each day in Parliament to see how 
they can rewrite the standing orders to allow for more input from the crossbench. Because even though Labor is a majority and could ignore the crossbench, they need to respond to crossbench concerns given their own diminished vote. But by responding to crossbench concerns, they can also maybe ensure the crossbench shows that it's got influence and that those teal independents in particular get re-elected. And um, the teal independents took seats from the Conservatives. So it's in Labor's interest that the teal independents get re-elected and those seats don't go back to the Conservatives. Mm -hmm. This is a brave new world. And I'm really excited for young people in particular that they will see this type of parliament because we have seen the most appalling behaviour in our parliament, federal parliament for the last 10 years. It has been highly personal, adversarial, nasty, um, not attention to the thing that really motivates me and that is problem solving, not just in the environmental area, but in social areas of social justice, et cetera. It hasn't been a problem solving parliament. It's been a point scoring, politicking, nasty adversarial mess. And fingers crossed, they haven't, they haven't sat yet, but I think this parliament is going to behave quite differently. Absolutely. I think there's a lot of really, really good points that we can latch on to and uh, run away with. Uh, one of the first things is maybe just defining that cross bench for our audience, for anyone that's outside. My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, Professor, but uh, a cross bench is the area in the lower house that is comprised of the minority uh, party. So this would be the independents and the Greens. Um, but one thing that you alluded to is that now the Labor government have formed a majority in the lower house. And my understanding of that means is that if they put through a bill, uh, they can pass it just based on the amount of, because they have a majority, they can just pass it without having to uh, gain the uh, approval of the independents or the Greens party. Um, and so that to me seems like for uh, climate policy, maybe a bit of an issue. Uh, for the reason that Labor's policy for climate is to have a 43% reduction. And the teals and independents, uh, the teals and the greens have a much stronger climate action. And so, in theory, it seems like Labor could put through uh, maybe a, a policy or a bill that is slightly underwhelming in terms of climate action. Uh, what do you think this means in terms of the current makeup, specifically for environmental policy, and not only for climate, but for things like land clearing, uh, things like water? Uh, all these sort of environmental issues. What does the current makeup mean? Okay, so um, for the listeners, if you can imagine a horseshoe and over one side of the horseshoe, it's predominantly red. Well, that's where the 77 Labor members sit. On the right-hand side of the horseshoe, it's predominantly blue. That's where the Liberal and National Conservatives sit. And then at the brow of the horseshoe, we call it the crossbench because these are the independents, the Greens and the Teals that sit between the major parties. And had Labor not managed to get 77 seats, if it had just been a few short, then that crossbench would have been required to help it pass legislation in, or let's call it a bill, call it a, uh, um, a bill in the lower house. Now, but they don't need them now. Um, chances are, they'll talk to them to some extent. But if we just pause there for a moment and think about what happens next. So Labor may pass a bill in the lower house, which is then headed to the Senate. It also has to pass the Senate to become law or legislation. And in the Senate, we are still counting, <laughs> but in the Senate, it looks like the Greens will have the balance of power. And so the Labor Party will have to get the Greens on side to pass legislation, likely to pass legislation in the Senate. We'll just got to wait for the counting. Um, now, they have another option, of course. They can talk to the Conservatives. So they can say to themselves, well, we don't have much in common with the Greens. On this bill, well, basically the opposition agrees with us. So let's, let's, let's talk to the Conservatives and ignore the Greens. They may do that on some legislation and uh, on bills to become legislation. And on the other hand, on other issues, they may talk to the Greens and say, 
we've got something innovative in um, social justice and health and Indigenous policy and we'd like your support. And so they may switch backwards and forwards. Now to return to your other point, um, isn't this a problem, the makeup of the house, a, a problem for climate change? First of all, if, if anything in the climate change policy of the Labor government that it took to the election needs legislation, then yes, they have to navigate it through the Senate for it to become law. And the Greens would hold them up and say, hang on a sec, you can't legislate a target that is 43%. We want you to 43% uh, cut in emissions by 2030. We want that to be 100% um, cut by 2035, which is the Greens' position. So they, uh, Labor could then say, well, actually, you know, we've never had a legislated um, emissions reduction target and we wanted it, but if you're not on board, we still won't have it. We'll just leave it. Or we'll take something to the opposition and see if they'll now jump on board and support a 43% because the opposition needs to do something better than previously. So that's a possibility. They may go to the Greens. The Greens may say yes or no. They may then either drop an idea or they may go to the opposition or they may go to the number of independents that are in the Senate that may be required. So there's, there's a lot of negotiating that goes on in the Senate, which is quite um, good for democracy. It means that a government can't just uh, ram through something in the lower house and then um, it becomes law. It has to go through the Senate. And governments are always trying to get a majority in the Senate so that they can just pass things unfettered. It never happens. The Australian people always vote for a Senate that is going to put a check on government, always. We've always done it. It's just a wonderful quality to see in the Australian people. They, they don't mind changing the government by changing the lower house vote, but then they'll turn around and they'll do the opposite in the Senate because they want to check on power. Now, just to a further answer to your question is, the way that Labor has designed its climate policy is a lot of it doesn't need legislation. So a lot of it is just taking existing mechanisms and making them work better or introducing policies and spending and expenditure um, that doesn't need legislation. So I, I think a fair amount of, of um, action on climate change can happen immediately and doesn't even have to go through parliament. For example, support for electric vehicles, the powering um, Australia, which is basically our, our grid is, um, oh, what's the word? It's, it's, it's running to the end of its usefulness and it needs, um, that we need to rewire our electricity grid so that we can cope with surges and we can bring on board all the rooftop solar and a whole bunch of transitioning type things. They can get started on that. So um, the, uh, energy oh the climate minister is meeting today with his counterparts around the country to see how much they can just get going on energy policy for example from today just in cooperation with the states and territories without needing legislation so it's a sort of watch this space and i think underlying your question was a concern that uh, there's a lot of um uh analysis out there that says that the Labor Party is really not putting up very ambitious proposals on climate and is going to have to steepen those. My suspicion will be they will, they will go all out to implement exactly what they've put up and as they head into the next election and as they become accountable to the international community through international meetings, et cetera, they will start tightening it and steepening it. Hopefully. <laughs> yes, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and I suppose that makes a lot of sense as well, because uh, that will be further leverage for the next election, the uh, next election for the Labor part, Party, and also able to gain, maybe recapture those green seats that they lost. Yes. Uh, or maybe to capture some of the teals that uh, have moved a bit to the left from being yes. former Liberals and maybe moving further left and being Labor. Um, I suppose something that I found very interesting after the day of the election was seeing the, our Prime Minister go to uh, meet with President Biden and the President of Japan and the Prime Minister of India. And 
something I was very interested in is that he, uh, our prime minister, or one of the first things he was talking about was uh, Australia's changing narrative on how they see their role in climate action, which I thought was very positive. Um, but I suppose in terms of the global context, obviously Australian is a Western democracy with a, that holds a lot of power despite its very small size. Uh, how do you see our climate policy reverberating around the world? If, if in fact it could do that, do you see uh, it having positive impacts or perhaps what am- impacts do you think it could make? Yes. Um, uh, yeah, you're right, because Australia has such... It, it, it emits um, such a small percentage of global emissions that uh, the previous government said, well, why should we really even worry too much about it? Because whatever we do is not going to make a big difference. And, you know, that's that's a bit of a furphy, as we say here in Australia, for in some ways, because if all countries said that, there'd be no action from anyone. When you add up all of the 1.5% or 2% or 3% contributions to global emissions. So that's just really, really short-sighted. So Australia has had a reputation on the international stage as a laggard country. It's just um, always put its coal export industry and its domestic coal-fired needs before its international obligations. And and if it has at times committed to um, the global community at various international meetings, that it would steepen its actions. I've always called it these sort of commitments in brackets, anything but cut emissions commitments. So yes, we will act and we'll do that by offsetting or yes, we will act and we'll do that by supporting international action, but we won't do anything here because we'll support you doing it there. Um, Yes, we will act, but we're gonna increase our coal-fired exports and our reliance on coal-fired power because it'd be economically disadvantageous for us to do that and the international community can't expect us to indulge in self-harm. So we've had all of these excuses while we've been saying, but yes, we're going to act and it'll be ambitious. And in fact, we're world leading, which is the most extraordinary, extraordinarily ridiculous thing that's been trotted out over the years. And this all came to a head in 2007 when in opposition, a Labor opposition said, actually, we will actually act. Um, We will bring in uh, a range of tools and I think the opposition leader, Kevin Rudd, said we'll price carbon, um, elect us, we will ratify the Kyoto Protocol, we will go to the next international meeting, um, apologising for our past laggardly behaviour and that was a great moment and that became a climate change election and Labor was elected and went on and failed to do that for a range of political reasons failed to realise its climate ambitions. Um, So then we went back to being an international laggard eventually again after after a very brief period of two years where we did manage to get carbon pricing in place and emissions started to fall immediately. It lasted two years. The government changed back to the Conservative Coalition and they dismantled our carbon pricing scheme which was actually a really good economy-wide scheme. If you're, ever, if you're ever looking at it, if you need to write an essay for economics and go back and look at the 2012 to 2014 carbon pricing scheme in Australia, economy-wide was one of the best schemes internationally and it was kicked, kicked to the curb before it had had more than two years. We went back to being a laggard, laggards then and that's really where we sit. So when the government changed the other day and I think almost the next day our new Prime Minister went overseas and in particular met with Joe Biden and said we are now going to seriously act on climate change, I think it's a huge relief internationally. Um, And when we go to our next international meeting, the Conference of Parties, wherever that's held next, that will be the last time we went to an international meeting after the election of the Labor government that had committed to real action, there was a standing ovation. And I think our current prime minister will probably get the same thing. There'll be a standing ovation of sorts. Um, And, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely dire. We need to get on with it. And hopefully this time at COP, 27 our booth isn't sponsored by santos which would be uh, which would be great <laughs> oh, I know. Um, yes the previous um cop meetings we've had um 
fossil fuel executives standing around ready to talk to the audience. Um, it's been pretty appalling, you're right. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, I think I think this takes us into an interesting place then um, because it means there's a huge opportunity for action, there's a huge opportunity uh, economically and financially, um, and also a huge, uh, huge opportunity to uh, lobby, uh, lobby new interests for the sake of the islands, the Pacific islands, which are, have a, uh, who are at huge risk of climate, but most importantly, um, preventing any further damages to the climate. And on that note of damaging climate, there's, uh, there's, uh, I, I read your article on the Green New Deal. Um, and that is a, a, a mechanism or a document or a piece of legislation, I'm not too sure, which to me seems like a very interesting way of enacting everything that we've sort of been talking about into a policy uh, mechanism, which can lead to huge action, uh, huge economic benefits, and a, and a rapid, uh, rapid de-escalation and decarbonization of, of a country. Um, would you be able to tell us about uh, about the Green New Deal and perhaps if other countries or maybe Australia specifically, whether you foresee this being enacted? Yes, um, I love the Green New Deal concept. When I first finished my PhD, which was on environmental uh, decision making and um, power and politics in Tasmania, as soon as I'd finished it, I found myself writing about green jobs. I just got fascinated by the idea of green jobs. And, um, and in a way, at that time, they weren't talking about green new deals as green jobs. They were, it was before then, they were talking about um, acting on, the, on environmental concerns would, would create and inspire an environment industry which would uh, build green jobs, which would be like a sort of new industrial and economic revolution and could solve big problems like, hey, climate change, which is gonna be a big problem. And this really captured my attention. And I ended up um, at the state government level here in Tasmania, I ended up chairing uh, uh, an environment industry council for the state government for a, a period of time. And we wrote an environmental industry plan for the state. And um, that was quite ahead of its time. So then subsequently, um, Maybe if I just go back to the global financial crisis and economic recovery out of the global financial crisis, and you, as students of economics would know this, that sometimes economic crisis is a moment of great opportunity to see things really differently that, and to, to, to um, just move away from path to dependency where everything has to be the way it's always been and open the door to really innovative ideas. And so... Post the global financial crisis, if, um, if people go back and look at some of the recovery plans that were coming out of, the, out of Europe, maybe the EU specifically, a lot of them were starting to talk about green new deals. So we've just had a global financial crisis. We don't want to rebuild our economic system so that it has this propensity for collapse again. So let's make it resilient. And, and in doing that, why don't we embrace environmental challenges and use those to pull economic levers to, to accelerate us forward into a different type of more sustainable economy, still with growth, but with sustainable growth and a whole bunch of um, environmental benefits. So that's probably in, in 2008, 9, 10, where you saw out of quite a few different countries in Europe in particular, Green, Green New Deal, so, and then if we jump over to the USA, Barack Obama embraced the idea of a Green New Deal. I'm not sure how, um, because I didn't research it, I didn't have time, but I'm not sure how broad and deep his policy mechanisms were. A Green New Deal can be an economy-wide New Deal with a whole range of policy mechanisms for action in different sectors. Or it could be, for example, as Obama put up, um, he would, yes, he would re rescue the car industry in America, but only if they signed on to a Green New Deal, which was going to be about moving away from gas guzzling cars and towards, you know, electric vehicles and um, more environmentally friendly cars in all sorts of ways, emission with emission control tools and a whole bunch of other things. So a Green New Deal 
um, was then if we jump ahead and that that was quite successful the Obama and because it came from Obama rather than from a Green Party it's always more successful when a Green New Deal proposal doesn't come from the Greens so it's not treated as an ideological problem it's treated as an economic opportunity if it comes from a mainstream political party ironically so um, then we come to Australia and Adam Bant, when he became leader of the Australian Greens a couple of years ago, 2020, I think, he started talking about a Green New Deal as a way of economic recovery in Australia post-pandemic. And in fact, probably, I again haven't yet had time to look around the world, but um, I took a brief look for that article you referenced there in the conversation I did on the Green New Deal. There was some talk about Green New Deals as a way of recovering from the pandemic, again, from Europe. I noticed in Sweden, part of their Green New Deal as post-pandemic recovery would include an investment in biodiversity because reducing biodiversity increases the likelihood of future pandemics because you, you get rid of the animal, human, um, natural barriers, ecological barriers. So. Adam Bant talked about Green New Deal and because it was a Green Party talking about it, it was just poo-pooed, you know, like as we love to do in Australia with our adversarial political system, you know, Adam Bant's off his tree is an ideological zealot, what's a Green New Deal and why would we want it? But if you look at Labor's um, climate policy, which they're calling an energy policy, by the way, um, a lot of it is Green New Deal ideas. And a lot of it talks about climate as positive for the economy and job creating um, and building economic resilience. That's all Green New Deal stuff. This is great. If, if there's any students out there that want a great honours thesis or um, postgraduate study, the Green New Deal is a brilliant area of study. I loved looking at um, green jobs um, on my University of Tasmania uh, profile all my publications, there's a link to them. And if you go scroll back a couple of decades, you'll find my green job stuff. Fascinating. And so I, 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 see, I guess the sense I'm getting is that by there's a, a sort of a political game in amongst an attempt to implement anything that is similar to a Green New Deal. And it seems like Labor government uh, by perhaps not labeling it as a green new deal, but labeling it as an energy policy, which is a lot more neutral, um, allows for much more progressive climate environmental policies to be implemented without that same opposition. Um, yes. And it's, it's almost like a cognitive dissonance or cognitive bias sort of a problem where a certain label uh, that is attributed to something, whether that's policy or uh, the party that someone is in, uh, can create uh, certain connotations, which if you're a part of a political camp, you will automatically disregard, even if it is logically coherent and yeah. uh, economically beneficial or environmentally friendly, um, which is really fascinating. And I think tying all this together, uh, in terms of the political atmosphere, the Green New Deal, environmental policy shifting towards climate change. Do you think that uh, advocating, and I'm going to move to a bit more Australian centric, but do you think advocating for a Green New Deal specifically is something that's worth doing? Or do you think uh, going along with how Labor are sort of presenting their policies is the way to go? Uh, I think in Australia, because of our history and our very recent history of political adversarialism on environmental issues, it's worth picking the eyes out of Green New Deals and packaging them up as economic stimuli, stimuli um, and economic development proposals. So uh, when I um, was asked by the Tasmanian government to chair an environment industry council, it was a Labor government, and I tried to use language that was all about industry um, industry restructuring, industry, industry change, economic development, growth, jobs, um, but feeding in ideas that were really straight out of the Green New Deal playbook, but just moderating the language. And that way you get a very good reception. Um, mm. 
And it's funny because I think the role of Green parties is to put those ideas on the table and keep putting them on the table and then find them taken up and appropriated, hopefully um, not in a way that distorts them. And then the Greens will come back again and put mm. some more ideas on the table. Um, so they're like an ideas trust and they're not... In, in a country like Australia, which is very adversarial in its politics, they're not thanked for pushing the envelope on, on environmental issues or green new deals, green jobs, et cetera. But when the ideas take hold um, in the mainstream media and in the mainstream parties, then the Greens will put further ideas on the table. And that's why they get maligned with, you're never happy. You know, you're always, you're always trying to wreck things. You're always because they will keep pushing. When they get one thing taken up, they'll, they'll, they'll think, right, we've got that. Now we need to go further. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and this idea of uh, the minority parties being the, proposal, the proposers of ideas is yeah. something that's quite fascinating to me. And there, there was a, uh, I read this book recently by one of the, I think, former economic minister, Yanis Varoufakis of Greece, and he's former oh, yes. academic as well. Yes, um, and he has this quote, and I want to I want to pitch it to you, given that your area is public policy, environmental policy, because I think this seems to be coming at odds, and I'd love to hear t your thoughts on this. So, he says most politicians cannot be theorists. Firstly, because they are rarely thinkers. Second, because the frenetic lifestyle they impose on themselves leaves no time for big ideas. I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Whether you d disagree, agree. Um, because I definitely see merit to what you're saying as well. And at the same time, I also recognize that politicians are only representatives of their electorate. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? I think um, one of my immediate thoughts is, is, and this is jumping to America, is often people that do well in American political life have written their book beforehand. And in that book is their ideas. And then they get into office and try to implement them or they get into the House or the Senate um, or wherever and try to push their ideas, which is in their book, you know, so they wear their heart on their sleeve. Um, there may be a bit of a brain's trust going through or they may just keep sticking with their big ideas so people know who they, they are. Then if you come back to Australia, I think the minor parties and independents are free to push push ideas and we're going to see some huge, we haven't seen it yet because parliament hasn't sat, but the teal independents who are all professional women largely are going to really push ideas because they will have the time. They don't, they're not members of political parties. Members of political parties spend 50% of their time on their own careers and manoeuvring for their career advancement, playing their role in the party and making friends with members of the party that are in their interest. And then the other 50% of the time, they represent their electorate. So the Teal Independents can spend 100% of their, their time on developing ideas and trying to find ways to push them through the system. Um, the Greens are an ideas trust and they will continue to be, and that will be really challenging. And some of those ideas they may use as negotiating tools in the Senate if they want to, if they're called upon to pass legislation. But then so that the opposition has time to develop ideas. They don't have to govern. And they also don't necessarily have to have the detail backing it up because in Australia, if you're in the government, you have the executive, the public service, helping you flesh out your ideas and make sure that they can be implemented and that they're financially viable, blah, blah, blah. In opposition, you can just throw up ideas. So that leaves us with the government. And there's a lot of very um, intelligent people, obviously, in the government, maybe even some prior academics. I think they will have come in with a very strong idea of what they want to do that was developed in opposition. And I think in government, you're right, their time will be taken up trying to implement negotiate to implement, find the finances to implement, get stuff implemented before the next election because I know this government's going to be looking for a second term. So they're going to be looking, they're going to be looking for a second term because the 
opposition is in disarray and, and diminished. Um, if they're going to be developing any new big ideas, it'll be in the lead up to the next election. I think for the next three years, if you look at the Federal Labor Party's policies they took to the election on the website, that's going to be their ideas. I don't know if that's, it's it's probably more just pragmatic nuts and bolts at this stage mm. for the government rather than anything else. No, definitely. No, I, um, I, think, I think that captures it all very well. And I, one final question before we get on to, uh, before we wrap it up, I wanted to get your thoughts, given that this is sort of your area expertise on what are your uh, predictions or maybe your forecast, your rough forecast for where things may go in the next three years and what will happen with relation to environmental policy. Yeah. So environmental policy is something I've been keeping my eyes on because there hasn't been any um, for a while. I did a, I did a um, chapter, uh, there's, there's a new Australian um, handbook of Australian politics, which came out 2020, I think. Um, it's an edited collection and I did the chapter on environment um, and so I've been keeping my eyes on it and there hasn't been, there's been, um, there's been a dismantling of environmental policy and uh, just uh, routine policy failure from the conservative governments that we've had over the last 10 years. So there's a pretty straightforward agenda for the Labor Party to, to get cracking with implementing because we've had a couple of recent reviews of the state. One is the State of Environment of Australia the previous government wouldn't release that before the election. So this new incoming government will release that state of environment report, which will tell us where we need to act. And then they need to get on and act as per the recommendations of that report. There's also been a Samuel review into environmental policy, legislation procedures, um, et cetera, um, how well things have been implemented or not implemented, what's been dismantled and needs to be re-established that has got a set of recommendations just waiting. So just those two things alone. Then on top of that, the Labor government has said that it's going to introduce a bit of um, public administrative architecture, for example, an environmental protection body. I'm not quite sure what sort of body, whether it's independent or... So there are already three big jobs now and there's only three years. So just those three things alone, they sort of need to be in place. Um, but immediately decision making that's threatening the environment needs to be halted or paused and it might be up to the public and the attentive community to say hang on uh, the previous government just um, dismantled all our protection mechanisms for threatened species so can you please put it back now you know so there's going to be some actions like that coming from community groups. I read about that the other day from um, the Wilderness Society. So there's a lot of work for the new environment minister, um, Tanya Plibersek, who, who was previously education minister. And some people think she's been demoted by getting moved to the environment portfolio. But she's actually a very good bureaucrat as well as politician. And I'm hoping that she'll prove her worth in this portfolio. And if she doesn't, the Greens are, uh, are edging closer to her, to getting, to destabilising her in her own seat. So they've given the environment portfolio to a minister who, when she goes to the next election, will have Greens campaigning to undermine her in her own seat. So if she doesn't do a good job in the environment portfolio, the Greens are going to have a better time of taking that seat. That one's going to be really interesting. Absolutely. Well, I can say living in the inner western Sydney, uh, and and uh, seeing the Greens turn out, that seems to that will be a very interesting see, thing to see how it plays out. Yeah. Now, I guess to wrap up everything, Professor, um, I think there was a lot of super fascinating things. The name of our podcast is called Utopias Now. And it's yes. about moving towards the horizon with the horizon being the ideal, the utopia, so to speak, but moving so in the present being now by acting out our decisions and doing the best we can to keep moving. And so a question that we ask all of our guests is, 
what does your utopia look like? And we've been talking about environmental policy. You can frame this within the, within the parameters of what the ideal environmental policy actions would look like, or even your personal uh, utopia. What, what, what does that look like? Um, it's funny you should ask that because I was asked to write a piece for an exhibition that's coming up on the campaign to restore Lake Pedder, which is a, um, a little glacial lake in the Western Tasmanian wilderness that was flooded and there's a campaign to restore it. I've written a lot about that politically and how difficult it would be. So I decided this time I would jump into 2050 and I would look back and I would um, be at the opening of a museum in the Southwest wilderness talking about the campaign to restore it and how successful it was. And it was as unimaginable as um, ending global warming once seemed to us all. So I've actually been there, I future visioned, I've been to 2050 and looked back and it really changed me. Um, for a start, I didn't think that the road to my utopia, which I called um, an epoch of global greening, I didn't think that it was a straight path. I thought it was full of a lot of contingencies and happenstance and um, focusing events that people suddenly went, oh my gosh, um, things have to be different. So I guess so my utopia would be one of global greening and there'd be restored biodiversity planetary wide because that's a huge problem that um, we now are embarking on the UN decade on it ecological restoration this year, I think, from 2022. And so in that decade, in my future piece in, that I wrote for 2050, I thought I said that decade of ecological restoration wasn't very successful right up till the last minute when there was a flurry of major projects suddenly paid for, including the restoration of Lake Pedder. So I envisaged there'd be a lot of opposition to, the, to my utopia to my utopian ideas. But the thing that I said that um, turned the corner besides random events was that environmental issues started percolating into the major parties in Australia. The major parties started to fracture, which we've actually seen now at this election, and they started to lose their power. And the parties that started to replace them were greener, whether they were green parties or not. And then underlying that, the other impetus for realising my utopia was that the generation growing up, whether they were politically left, right or centre, all just took ecological um, integrity and the need to protect it for granted. For example, a lot of them remembered the pandemic and I made it a decade of pandemic rather than a few years. And um, they remembered the green jobs revolution that came from climate action. And so to them, it was just logical in my utopia, it was just logical that you wanted green jobs and you wanted ecological restoration because you didn't want more pandemics and we've gotten rid of global warming. So that's my utopia. Well, I must say that must be, if there was an award winning for best, uh, best thoughts on what a utopia would look like, I think, I think you, you've, you've got that one, uh, Professor. <laughs> um, it's very vivid. And I think, uh, I think it'd be an interesting exercise for all of us to sort of look into the future and retrospect on what could be um, and maybe yeah. aim for that as the ideal. And I think that's a great place to end it. Um, so I'd like to thank you so much, Professor, for coming on. It was a, a pleasure speaking with you. Yeah. And, um, and uh, best of luck with your book. I'd love yes. to read it. <laughs> yes, um, Climate Leadership in East Asia Pacific. It's very messy, which is, I love it. I love a good murder mystery and um, I love a good problem to <laughs> solve. And so trying to work out how you could get climate leadership in the East Asia Pacific is a real it's like a real um, Rubik's Cube. It's a puzzle. I don't mm. know, but uh, I'm looking forward to finishing it because um, I want it to be read. I actually think I might write pieces about it before it is finished so that it starts getting out there. Yeah, of course. And if you wanted to, if people want to learn more about your work, where can they find you, Professor? Um, so I've, one of the, I think the easiest way in is to Google the Kate Crowley, The Conversation. 
And there you'll find the, there's not a lot of pieces there. There's about eight, 800 word articles, but I've tried to list all my publications on my profile there. So it's either there or you can go to my University of Tasmania profile and my publications are there. Um, and if, if you like any of them and if you Google their name and add research gate, a lot of them I've uploaded and can just be downloaded. I did a book on um, green supported minority government in Tasmania and I just uploaded the whole book to ResearchGate. Mm, mm, absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I'm sure I'll make sure that all those links are available. Again, thank you very much, Professor. And it's been great no to worries. speak with you. Thanks for inviting me on. It was a pleasure.